All right. So what I'm going to do is just kind of do a quick review um, and kind of wrap up farming the controllables. Obviously, it's the knowledge that gives you understanding. And, and that's what we're trying to supply to you. We have the toolbox of different tools we can use to apply to the farming and control recipe for success. And then it comes down to developing a tailored program for each crop, whether it's sugar beets or dry beans or alfalfa or corn or soybeans. Uh, and tailoring that to your specific operation. At the end of that, it actually is going to give you, which I didn't, she didn't put on here for some reason. At the end, you are going to have a summary of what the program costs per acre like right here on this one, what the cost per acre is and the cost per bushel based on yield. So in this one I put together last year for a grower on corn, it was 87.52 an acre for all the way through the recipe based on his operation and that is, doesn't include the base fertility program. And then I gave him, if he's going to raise 250 bushel corn, that was 35 cents a bushel cost. And so it's all laid out and tailored specifically to your operation. So let's just go through here. So we're going to talk about real quickly, we've already talked about a lot of this stuff already. But I just want to reemphasize managing crop residue. Just look at the benefits, the cough offsets uh, that you have. And, and tell me it won't work for you. This is, it's just unbelievable. And the more I work with it, the more I'm amazed. Again, as we can wean ourselves from the high salt fertilizers, the anhydrous, and the heavy applications of nitrogen. Remember, what does nitrogen, heavy application of nitrogen applications do? It drives what? What type of microbes? bacteria. And really what we really need to do is bring the fungal back. So he just told you what he's doing with some growers in, in his program. I got a yep. uh, can you um, apply this uh, fall crop residue management program after you do fall tillage? Is there going to be a difference or do you need to apply it first on the hard stock? No, you can do it afterwards. And like I said, he, Matt is, he's a strip tiller. So he's, he's just moving the, the residue around. So last year they sprayed and then they, they, they strip tilled. He could do it afterward. Um, just so you get it out there. I, I would say, and I think Dennis would agree, if you get a little dirt on it, it's probably going to help it. Okay, uh, but you don't need to. Um, some guys will go out with, with that real light tillage tool that just kind of cuts stuff a little bit and blends it in the upper surface type of thing. That would be a good tool to use. But again, you got to remember, you're on a journey. And just like manure treatment, I tell guys, you do it after three years, you're going to see a tremendous difference in your soil. You're going to see a yield improvement of 5 to 15%. The crop residue thing is going to be the same thing. It's going to get better and better to the point where you can probably start cutting back. Okay? Once you get your soils where you need them, with the fungal bacteria ratios, and you're harvesting nutrients out of the air, and sequestering that, it, again, it will change. So on this sheet here, 
there's really just a, a lot of information and you got that pan, uh, handed out to you. Have you got that one? If you don't, we can get it to you. You need one? Anybody need one? Do you want to get them there, over there, please? All right. So the reason why we're talking about managing and sequestering carbon. So this was really a, a good study. So biological uh, carbon sequestration and CO2 cycling. Carbon is often the limiting nutrient in crop production. Carbon and H2O and sunlight produce glucose, which is the energy component of crop production. Remember, it takes 100 pounds of glucose to produce one bushel of corn and 300 to produce one bushel of soybeans. So it drives all the plant functions above and below ground. The plant exudates 40% of the glucose into the soil to feed the microbes and build soil and build bioactive carbon thus improving soil structure, infiltration, nutrient availability and retention, aerobic environment, and improvement in nitrogen fixation. If your soils are tight, like some of those soils we looked at yesterday, you're not going to get very good nitrogen fixation in the soil because you're limited on the ability of these microbes to live and breathe. So then CO2 cycling and energy uh, again, using the UBO as a driver along with your microbes, either bio, bio nurture, which we put on at planting time or foliar or pre-emergence at planting, and then the bio regenerate, which is in our fall crop residue program. Again, what they're going to do is they're going to stimulate the microbes to enhance CO2 cycling and energy for growth. And then if you look at the one soil test right here, this one right here, let's just look at that. Uh, so the Sovetit test, CO2 burst test, is the ability to uh, a very good indicator of soil health. This test measures the amount of CO2 naturally released from the soil due to the activity of the soil microbes through microbial respiration. Okay, so what we're saying is, as we, through our residue program, trap more carbon in the soil, then that microbes are going to then release that as CO2 back up into the, into the canopy during the growing season. The quantity of the CO2 which crops take up compares closely to the amount of CO2 which the soil is capable of producing. So if you look, and then you have the soil health indicator and calculations use CO2 burst, organic carbon, organic nitrogen, and C carbon to nitrogen ratios to generate a soil health number. This calculation looks at the balance of soil carbon and nitrogen and their relationship to microbial activity. This number represents the overall health of your system. So when you look at the top one right here, look on your sheet, untreated. So where we look at the CO2 burst, it was 39.8 in the control. When we looked at the treated area with the bio nurture, it was 90.2. Now, when we looked at soil health in the control, again here, description, it was 4.2. When we looked at the treated, it was 9.3. So this is a kind of a evaluation of, of measuring the activity and the result of applying the, the bio nurture. When we looked at bio regenerate, the untreated had, uh, when we looked at the CO2 burst, it was 62.7, and on the control, and 98.1 on the treated. On the soil health calculation, it was 9.3 and 11.2.
So again, this is just a, a, a way of, through numbers of an, an analysis of documenting what is happening in the soil with these applications. Any questions on that? So what are the ways to build soil organic matter? Crop rotation, cover crops, plant roots exudate liquid carbon up to 40%. Uh, again, uh, add microbial cocktails. And probably I'm going to start emphasizing more and more if, guys, if you don't want to hassle with cover crops because you just don't want to do it or put up with it or whatever, these microbes in this crop residue program in the fall are a tremendous, what I would say, way of doing it and getting some of the same results. I'm not saying it replaces cover crops necessarily because the functions are a little different, but it really gets you to, you know, start in the right direction. And then, of course, using the UBO, whoop, using the UBO with it, we've talked about this, driving the whole process, reducing tillage as much as possible, reducing N applications, Mark talked about that, and how he's working with his producers to get the amount of nitrogen. You know, Dennis and I have been talking for years, you know, if you follow this program, we can reduce our N rates by 50% and our overall nutrient dollar because of how we're managing the system and the availability. Bio-augment bio manure, we talked about that, why that's important today. And then the use of humates and biochar. And humates, again, is just another way of feeding the system uh, if you want to integrate it into your program. Dennis, you know, can talk at length about stand optimization. And <laughs> He's been talking to me all summer about going out with his growers and what he's seeing, but the fact is, if your crop doesn't come up uniform and there's any kind of gaps in that or doubles or unevenness for whatever reason, that is going to cost you yield, as you can see right here. You know, versus the ideal situation, uh, Later emergence, we're starting to cut down, wh whatever that might be, and of course, unevenness in the stand. You can see the impact it has on your overall potential yield. So really, this is an area that most growers really need to pay a lot of attention to. Um, it all comes down to operation of the planter, like like Matt said yesterday, how you set that up. And, uh, and then, of course, the other part of this is seed quality. And, you know, I, I get to see what's going on in this building with all the seed that comes in out of here every year. And I tell you what, when they start blending two and three year old seed together with this year's seed and all, you know, and really, be honest with you, most of the seed corn is raised in an industrial ag approach, okay? So you got seed to begin with that's compromised on energy and nutrition. And then if they start blending, who do you, what do you know you're buying? Like Matt. So we were shooting for, he'd been doing 10 ton sweet corn, we were shooting for 12 to 14. Put a program together. He planted, we put the seed coating on, and the stand was terrible. So since we treated here, I have the seed, because we always save samples, treated, non-treated, everything we do. So I took that and I germinated it. It ended up being a 65% germ. They gave him sweet corn that was 65% germ. And I tell you what, guys, if I were you to be smart, I would get a, a sample of your seed that you say you want to buy, and I'd have it evaluated before I ever put it in the ground. Because you don't know what you're getting in that bag. You're trusting that person. 
But what is it? What's really in that bag? How viable is that seed? And it doesn't take long for, to cost you dollars. So doing a good job of seed selection, finding out, you know, the quality is very, very critical. And we don't do, we just take their word and we grab it and we plant it. But I'm telling you, soybeans is even probably more important. Planting depth. And Dennis, just share with us, what, what kind of planting depth do you like to see on, on corn? And we passed out our little brochure that I made over 25 years ago. And I've ta we've taught a lot of people how to tell planting depth. Two to two and a half inches is where I like Two to two and a half inches. What happens is you plant shallow, Dennis? I've got some pictures here showing that, actually. <laughs> um, well, come up, up here for a minute. You don't have a, a smaller... Now, well, he's coming up here. So, in my previous career, when I started my company, we had a program that we would train all the new reps coming out of college that were going to go out. Just kind of come up here in front, please. Um, and so we put them through a five-day course. And we were bringing in maybe 50 people for a week from 15 different companies. And these are people that had been trained at the university. And we would teach them interpersonal skills of how to deal with people and identify personalities. Because until you do that, I, I don't care how much technical you have. If you can't communicate with somebody, and there's a difference of communicating with a Paul Pusher or a driver than a Freddie Friendly, and you need to know how to do that. So I wrote a book. Are complaints really opportunities? In there, I, I, I laid out all the personalities and how you handle them, how you identify them. Then we would teach them how to uh, stage corn and how to tell planting depth. Because, Mark, you're a rep working for a company. You sold an insecticide. The guy calls you in August and says, his corn is flopping over. He said, your insecticide didn't work. What are you going to do about it? Or maybe you sold him a herbicide, and he's saying, your herbicide did that. What are you going to do about it? In other words, in his mind, you're guilty before you ever step on that farm. So we would teach him how to walk in the field in August and determine the planting depth of corn. And then we put together little diagnostic guides. These were really neat. And it had pictures of all these different things. And, and they could use that guide to show the farmer well, look at this is what you're looking at. See the root? There's no roots here. It's floppy corn because you planted shallow. And they could show them why that was. So, you know, when a corn plant germinates, Dennis, doesn't it? It, it, it sends up the coleoptile with the, the point. Yeah. And when that touches light, it mm -hmm. stops growing, right? And then right. the radical comes out. Yeah. So. And does the cattle. Okay. Yep. So. So if you take and measure the distance of the mezzocotyl up to the crown, yeah. And add three quarters of an inch. That's the depth you planted. Right. And you can do that all through the year and you can't lie on what depth you're, you're planting. So this one was planted, wait, which one here? This one was planted at about an inch and a half, inch and three quarters. And we were starting to have corn that was starting to flop over. It didn't have the roots down in the ground. It was trying to put in more brace roots to stabilize that right. plant. And the corn was at least six to 12 inches shorter than the plants that were planted at two. And this was down at Bob Henderson's in Southern Iowa. And he had some areas that he has downforce on the planter, but he didn't have it set harsh enough for this area because they run silage wagons through there and it's really compacted. So he needed to put more downforce over on this area when he came over you know, to the other area where he doesn't put all the silage wagons. It's a lot looser. And we planted at two inches, and that's, that was much taller, it was much healthier. Uh, so just the difference in planting depth makes a huge difference. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you set your planter at an inch and a half, which that's what Iowa State says, that's the limit, I think that's too shallow because you hit, a, you know, you hit some uh, more yeah. compacted ground or you hit a rock or anything like that, all of a sudden you're at an inch and a quarter inch depth and then you're going to have issues with floppy corn syndrome. Now Dennis, what value is the fall residue program then to this what we just talked about? Absolutely because if you can break that residue down your planter's going to flow through that residue much What did easier. your guy out in Ohio tell you a week ago? 
Yeah, so that was Jeremy uh, Napke, and uh, he told me he was real skeptical on the product. He said, I just don't know if that stuff's going to work, and he didn't think it was working. And so they put it on last fall, they came in this spring and they ran uh, a vertical tillage machine through it, and he said those stalks just floated right over. And he got out and he, he broke the stalks apart and there was black inside of them and they were breaking down. Uh, he said, ah, yeah, that pretty much convinced me. And then they put in an order and ordered everything for this fall for the corn stalk. But ground. the planters just run more uniform. You don't have the hair pinning, the yeah. bunching. You maintain planting depth and the soils warm up better. Yeah, that's because stalk... you got all that microbial activity feeding off that that carbon sequestration. But that stock with the BT stocks, they're, they're just yep. like wood, and they're they're loaded with cellulose, they're loaded with lignin, and that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to stand there, and if you don't break that down, it's still wood when you go through with your planter, and it just it just hits it, and it doesn't really fold over, and that's where the hair pinning comes in, and it affects stand. Yeah, we saw some pictures yesterday on the soybeans where we had a lot of residue and there was much yep. less stand in there. But if we break that residue down, even start, you know, begin to break that residue down, it makes yeah. a big difference. Don't think because you use the fall residue program, the residue is going to be gone in the spring because it's not. No, it breaks down from the okay. inside out. Break, but it's going to be a lot. I mean, it's going to be just like, like so tender instead of tough. But the real difference is your soil, what it does to the soil. Yeah. So I, you can see right here, this was planted at one inch and one and a half and two and a quarter, just like what Dennis was talking about. Okay. Um, so Dennis, there are five ways to, to, to uh, minimize these challenges and optimize your corn stand. So obviously set your corn planter for success, follow proper planting depth, avoid work in the ground uh, when conditions aren't right. That's a big problem, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, with today's horsepower, you can go out there and, and they work it way too wet sometimes. You're never going to get away from that one. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't think guys are going to wait. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a big problem. But if you got to have your planter set properly. And then of course, the resident management. And I would add important. another one in here, and that would be check the seed you're buying. <laughs> well, talk about planters setting it up for success. One of the things that my producers are doing corn soybeans. Uh, we're putting them into two, uh, uh, two pump systems and two tank systems on their side. So you're running, uh, maybe you just can't get away from 1034 0 and, and so you've got to have a couple of those. You're going to run that at two by two and then you're going to drop the biology on Pass those around. So this one was planted at about an inch and a half or so. This one was planted at two inches, but look at the difference in the roots. Yep. See that two day. So that's what I was trying to show over here. It's always better to put that biology on the seed. And when you use the fall program, you put it you put it in the best conditions, uh, biologically active soil for just a bit. And that's why I say the seed treatment is not working for you. If you can get untreated seed, no, if you get untreated seed, then you put the prof coat PB on it. Okay, yeah. And again, you you can uh, buy the seed tender. There's a picture of it over there. Uh, they're stainless steel. They 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 really, if you take care of it, it'll last forever. Um, so again, we obviously we we po uh, really promote this whole biological seed event. Like Mark says, if you're getting insecticide and fungicide on the seed, I mean, you're, you're going counter to really where you want to go. What we really want to do is try to get, get especially the fungicides out of the program as much as possible. It's a weaning effect. Most of the effect you're getting on a fungicide is, is probably from the ethylene inhibitor, unless you have a lot of disease. But Many times I don't see that much disease out in these fields. The ethylene inhibitor is in these newer fungicides, and that's that's where they're they're talking about the um, enhanced crop health and things like that. It's that ethylene inhibitor that they're putting in there, that technology. 
And not to be redundant, I mean, when we're talking again about boosting soil and plant health, these are the, the building blocks that we think you should use. And minimize plant stress, maximize yield. Again, we're talking about uh, the bio-regenerate, the bio-nurture, the UBO, the stress away, the bio-energy plus, the bio-impact. Again, uh, everything on here except for stress away can be used in an organic system. And these are all the reductions in, in the tillage and the overall reduced tillage cost. Um, when you, when you, you look at this and, and as you reduce tillage, these are the benefits that you're going to realize. Obviously, tillage is very expensive when you look at equipment, and equipment wear and fuel and manpower. Um, the more we can get away from that and maintain a good working system by using biology as our tillers, which again goes into the crop residue program, it goes into our starter program, it goes into our foliar program. What can we do to reduce tillage costs? Because tillage is very evasive to the soil food web. And we want that to be optimized as much as possible. Obviously, we also want a system where we get good deep rooting of the crop to harvest what's down there and be brought up. This is some work that Don Rakowski did uh, looking at different tillage tools from mobile plow to no-till after five hours. We talked about this out in the field yesterday. And when we look at the CO2 loss, grams of CO2 per square meter, and then after 24 hours, again, carbon is our limiting nutrient. Carbon is the food for the microbes. Carbon creates bioactive carbon in the soil. Bioactive carbon holds water, it holds nutrients. It's a home for the microbes, it's a food for the microbes. What industrial ag has done with high salt fertilizers, excessive tillage and fungicides, is created a desert. And the more nitrogen you put on, the more it breaks down carbon. Right. The more it breaks down the organic matter. Right. Again, my alma mater, University of Illinois, did a study showing that the more nitrogen they put on, the more that carbon broke down, the more organic matter they, it, it decreased. Right. And they did it on the moral plots. So here, here's kind of what happened with anhydrous and this nitrogen deal. So we started out with soils that were premier, right? They had a lot of organic matter. Yeah. They started using these nitrogen sources and man, they saw a response. Why did they see the response? because of what they were releasing out of the soil. And after about eight years, what happened? They burnt the soil out and the response wasn't there anymore. So the guy goes to the local retailer and says, it's not working like it did when I started. What am I gonna do? And the answer is, we're gonna put on more. That's the moron theory. The moron theory, yeah. So, if this hammer doesn't work, we got another one for you. Yep, all sources of nitrogen. I, I know it's, it's absolutely needed for corn and, and small grains and everything else, but putting on excessive amounts definitely builds. Well, okay, you just told corn. us earlier that you got a grower, you were yesterday, that's gonna raise 300 corn, pounds of corn. 300 bushel uh, corn. 300 bushel with 100 pounds. When the rule of thumb by the universities is what? 1.2. 1.2. And Dennis and I have been talking 50% at least for years. How is he doing that? Re review that one more time with us. How is he going to do that? When you start working with these biologicals, you're, you're, we're given an amino acid form of nitrogen. So it's organic, so it's available, and it's soluble. And an amino acid form of nitrogen, even though it says 1.7 on the jug, it's really a tenth because it's available. And we don't know what to, you know, everybody says you can, you can multiply it by at least five, maybe 10, 
to, to actually get the numbers, but we have to get this lineal approach in, in agriculture that one plus one equals two. When you're looking in the biology world, it's much different than that. So when you look at the amino acid form of nitrogen, which is stable, it's more available, you can bring back your synthetics. Yep, and then, and then by doing that, uh, and then stimulating the nitrogen fixing, what, 8% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, or 78%? I mean, there's tons of nitrogen above every acre. It's free to harvest. And there's about eight microorganisms that will naturally, free living in the soil will do that. And then you have the legumes with the nodulation, the rhizobium. So there's a lot of nitrogen that's there free for you to harvest. And, and, you know, I, I, Mark, I never thought of it that way, but it, I'm glad you said that, that when you're using those, uh, like in the fish, the form of nitrogen in the, in the more of the amino acid form, that you can almost multiply that times a 10 factor or so, because it's going to be much more efficient. Right. Yeah. And, and when, the, when the plant goes through stress, and it does every year, too wet, too cold, too hot, whatever, um, it has to slow down and try to find nitrogen. So it's trying to metabolize other type of enzymes to go try to find nitrogen for it. And that's, that's when you have yield drag. Well, when you're at amino acid form, it does not have to stop to try to find a, to, a, a certain enzyme to, to metabolize that to be plant available. It's already there. The other thing that you're... Um now we're into, I think, the next to the last of the controllables that's utilizing crop rotation and cover crops. Why? Well, we want to, we just talked about it. We want to build that bioactive carbon, that living carbon. We're going to reduce runoff. We're going to maintain the moisture. Uh, we're going to reduce soil erosion. We're going to have the ability to resist uh, resiliency during droughts. We're going to hold more moisture. What is it? 1% organic matter holds 10,000 gallons of water um, per acre. Uh, it's going to help us control weeds because we're improving the environment. We're taking away the reason why the weeds are there to balance because we already are balanced. It. And, and, I, and again, what I need to add to this slide is this whole microbial thing. If cover crops aren't your deal, then the crop residue program and the microbes in the fall, in the spring, during the season, are going to get you somewhere to the same point. And, you know, here's a prime example of some work that was done by our rep over in Wisconsin, where they planted uh, the cover crop here and not here, and they came back and planted corn. Look at the difference. And, and again, that's all really, uh, driving that whole soil complex as far as health. And again, I, we believe in cover crops with the manure application. You can also put UBO there, as we talked about earlier. And uh, we talked about at length biologically treating the manure and all the advantages that go with that. Uh, this is actually, Dennis, I don't know if you remember it, this picture is from one of your growers over in South Dakota <laughs> that used biological treated manure and put it right in a strip-till zone and plant it over the top of it. Look at that root mass. So, again, these are all the attributes that come from, uh, you know, manage the manure properly, improve nitrogen fixation, weed pressure. It'll help with, with the manure breaking down the residue, helping there, uniformity in the field. Uh, it's going to give you a more uniform application of, of the bio-augmented manure versus the, the raw manure, like Chris was talking. If, if you have a lot of buildup on the bottom and you're hauling, and, and depending on your agitation job, and you're not using any biological, what you have initially is going to be completely different than what you end up at the end with all that sludge off the bottom. And you're going to have all kinds of streaking in the field. Let the microbes agitate that, take care of that. The other thing that's really, I think, a point that we haven't talked about is pre-digested manure, you have no lag phase. What happens when you put raw manure out in the field? 
Now you take an, all the microbes that are in your soil, depending on how diverse they are, and if you're an industrial ag grower, they're not very diverse, if they're there hardly at all, you're dumping a toxic material out there and saying, deal with it. High salt, who knows what we got in it, low microbial activity. Now you want to plant a crop? Have you ever seen raw manure put out in the spring and then plant a crop on top of it? It doesn't work very well. I remember uh, Red Willow Colony over by Brookings. Dairy said, hey, you want some manure? Sure, in the spring, yeah, well, haul it. They did, and their corn got about this high. It was a disaster. How much salt in dairy manure can have 80 to over 100, 100 pounds? Now, you're, all your microbes in the soil got to deal with that because their job is to detoxify and deputify. Meanwhile, you're trying to grow a crop over here. It doesn't work. But I'll tell you, if you do a, a good job like Chris described on by augmenting your manure on an annual basis and you haul that out in the spring, I feel very confident you could turn around and plant in that the next day and not have a problem because we're doing it because it's pre-digested, okay? And that's another benefit from that. So these are all the business performance reasons why you buy augment manure. Uh, uh, if nothing more than improve neighbor relations and community relations and, and reduce environmental impact. This is going to be a big thing in ag that they're going to hammer people on. And we have the solution, we have the story, if they'll listen. The other thing it's going to do, you're going to have less corrosion to your facilities. The equipment, the cement, the building, the application equipment. Doug Rollick, who's been working with us for probably 20 years, when he trades in his noon tanks, the dealer says, wow, they're in pretty good condition. There's not very much rust on these machines. And that's because he's integrated manure treatment into his manure hauling business. So he goes around and treats this manure on an annual basis, every one of his customers. So when he pulls in at two o'clock in the morning, they don't have to drop curtains and shell pigs because he know he doesn't have to worry about gassing them. They're not working around stinky manure. They don't have to over agitate the manure. He's using a defoamer. They pull in, they load, they go to the field with a full load. Instead of taking 12 hours to get a job done, they're doing it in eight. Less fuel, less equipment, less labor. Better happy neighbors. Mama in the house is happy because there's no flies or odor on the farm, right? Got to keep her happy. So this is the story that people need to hear. Uh, it just, number one, reducing potential risk. We talked about this this morning the risk that's involved with this. So that's the story and kind of backing up the, the controllable. Um, and that pretty much takes you through everything we wanted to talk about. Um, now you have to decide if you want to meet with one of us and like Dennis or whatever and have him tailor a program for you that's specific to your farm that involves the steps to get to where you want to be. It lays out what you need to do. And in case of a starter, let's say we put together five different things we want you to use in a starter. And we can blend it all together and send that to you in a tote so you don't have the mixing in most cases. Um, you got some pretty dynamic technology here when you start looking at the coatings, the natural fertilizers, uh, you look at the UBO, you look at the microbial products, you look at the fertility products that we have in tuning the trace elements, 
and then you get into the bioenergy and the bio, you're not gonna get this kind of technology anywhere else in the industry. There's no other company out here today, I believe, that can give you this story in a full circle system. And I think that's the advantage that we have to offer. So with that, um, are there any questions? Well, yeah, with the antibiotics, uh, the overuse of antibiotics, Larry kind of addressed that today. Um, you know, it, like he said, when he, he was in the business when he first started out, it was like me, uh, metal to the pedal, or pedal to the metal. And here, I, I, got a, I got a shot for you. I got a shot for this, I got a shot for that. And it, all it was is a dressing on top of a wound that wasn't healing. And we got the same thing in human medicine today. That's why I stay away from all this stuff. That's why I don't put anything in my body like the COVID shot. I just, we're not going to take it. I don't care if they pay me a million dollars. I won't take it. And if I were a young lady, young man, I, especially the young ladies, I would not take it because People let in and know that I've talked to says there's going to be repercussions down the road on human health. And that's just my belief. Everybody's right to their own belief and what they're going to do with their body. Um, but the same thing that we talked about here in animals and in the crop, guess what? apply to every one of you in your body. And if you want to live to be a ripe old age and be happy and enjoy life, the same principles apply. It's spiritual number one, mental and physical. Okay? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're going to go through some really rough times here, guys. We're going to go through some really rough times in our economy. And I, it kind of scares me, really, to be honest with you. I never thought at my age I'd ever see this happen. But a year from now, we're going to have, I think, trouble getting things. And, and we could see this whole thing, inflation, just get out of control. We've, it's already happening to us. As I mentioned the other day, we use citric acid. Well, it's gone up 70%, and then you can't even get it. Because all the pop companies are buying it up. And so, Fran and I have been talking about this, so we're stocking our shelves with good quality food right now to weather the storm if it comes. And so you need, you need to think about your families. Um, but this message about human health is not getting out to people because we're not teaching it in our schools anymore. And I'll tell you what, it makes such a difference in behavior of children to have that spiritual foundation, that mental foundation, and that physical, but also eating right. And um, so kind of think about that and how you can take this information home to help your family, your community, your farming operation. We're here to support you if you ask for help. And I'm glad we really did this. I was, didn't know, you know, COVID kind of prevented us from doing some of this stuff earlier. I wanted to do this for a couple reasons. One is because of the fall residue program, but really it made me get my act together and get all this done and laid out. Now we're ready for the winter meet, the fall meetings, the winter meetings, and this will take us around the circuit. So now we're ready to go out and do meetings, talk to people. We'll probably have another meeting here sometime this fall, maybe next spring. 
Uh, meanwhile, if you have a group that you'd like to have us talk to, we're available to come out and do that. Uh, we really appreciate the coalition partners with Mark and Pacific Grow and, and um, Andy with ABC Drone. Uh, we, we're going to build this coalition because the story needs to be told and we can't be everywhere. You know, it, it's, if you know somebody out there, a young person that would have, like to have a really good career in agriculture, tell them about us and we'll be willing to work with them if they've got the drive and the capability, you know. And I, I just tell my sales staff, nothing happens to something sold, okay? <laughs> and, and you've got to go out and make it happen. But it, I'll tell you what, there is such an opportunity in this marketplace right now, it's just overwhelming. But until, Mark, you tell somebody the story and it puts the light bulb on up here, and I'll tell you what, the toughest ones are the 50 to 70 year olds because they've been so ingrained. And I can get out of the pickup, like Doug Rowley, I said, Doug, I'm coming over, I was bringing over some stuff for the fall treatment. I said, is there anybody I need to talk to? Oh, why don't you go talk to my neighbor, you know? And the guy was about 55 years old. And I was gonna talk to him about the fall residue program. I stepped out of the pick, pickup, he happened to be in the yard, and within less than a minute, I knew that I shouldn't say anymore. And, and I just small talked with the guy and thanked him for just taking a minute with me and I got back in the truck and I left. Because the walls were so thick that I, I wasn't gonna change this man's mind. <laughs> and so you, this isn't for everybody because a lot of people just can't wrap their head around it. And it really, it's getting back to common sense and, and nature, really, when you think about it. And you got to realize, I, I spent years in this industry. I was trained in this industry. I was trained at the university. I was trained in Eli Lilly Alanco. And even when I left them and started my company, I thought, you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Until I found out, over time, it wasn't working. And all we were doing is digging ourselves a hole. And that's when we started transitioning. We took all our intellectual capital, and this is what we developed. So with that, I want to thank you for coming. We're going to have lunch. Um, if you've got questions of any of us, Chris, Dennis, I, um, Mark, uh, we have uh, Larry here again, and we have uh, Andy on the drone thing. We're really excited about that relationship and working with him and his farming operation. He's got a beautiful setup over there, a terrific crop going this year. Unbelievable. That crop over in that area of the country. We drove through that a couple weeks ago. Um, these are kind of some little cards you can take with you uh, that has the, uh, we, we use a lot of these at shows and pass out to people. And it has the recipe on the back. But just thanks for coming.